I like the uh, like to thank the Simons Foundation staff for uh, inviting me up here as well. So I'd like to begin with this slide. This is uh, one that highlights the autism prevalence in the United States. This uh, takes advantage of CDC data um, as well as data from other sources. Uh, as you can clearly see, the prevalence has uh, dramatically increased um, in the United States as it has in other countries. Um, the current uh, estimate is that one in 68 individuals has some form of autism. I think you all are familiar with what autism is. It's a neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, and at its core, it has uh, symptoms that include communication, um, deficits, as well as um, uh, repetitive and restricted behavioral uh, deficits. Uh, there's been a lot of talk as to what is leading to this increase. Um, and I think uh, to a large extent, this has to do with changing or broadening diagnostic criteria, as well as increased awareness. We also know that there's a strong sex bias. There are roughly four and a half times as many boys or males who are diagnosed with autism as opposed to females. And so there seems to be something about the female genome that is uh, protective. And so in an effort to try and understand what is really driving uh, autism or causing autism, it's, uh, it's become clear that there really are two key factors, uh, genetic factors as well as environmental factors. Um, the genetics we know much more about uh, from heritability studies. And so these are studies looking at identical twins um, and looking at concordance, like whether or not the, the two twins both have autism or if only one has autism. And these um, studies point to a heritability of around 50%. And so that means that uh, the chances of developing autism of the other twin is, is, is half. Um, so there's a, there's a strong genetic component. And so the question is, where is this heritability coming from? So there was a really nice study done uh, by um, Joe Buxbaum a few years ago um, and pointing to the, 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 the fact that a lot of this inherited uh, risk is coming from uh, common variants. So these are SNPs, single nucleotide variants, spread throughout all of our genomes that really make each of us unique. Um, and there also are a, no a small number of rare inherited variants that are uh, giving rise to this, uh, this risk. Uh, this is uh, sometimes a difficult concept to understand, like this common variation and how that uh, influences risk. There was actually a, a really nice uh, interview by um, the spectrum uh, from, um, of um, Thomas Bougeron, who's in France, who studies uh, common variation in autism risk. And he, he came up with this analogy of uh, driving through the, the hills or a canyon in Los Angeles in the summer where everything is dry, and if a match got thrown out of your car, there would be a high probability that that match would lead to a, to a fire. Whereas if you were to drive through that same canyon right now, which is rainy season, I'm sure you all have been hearing about the massive amounts of rain in California, um, that same match would really have probably no effect whatsoever. So you can think of these common variants uh, as either increasing or decreasing the, the propensity for something else, that match, to, to set off the fire, or in this case, autism. And so there's been a lot of work um, from uh, efforts funded by the Simons Foundation to identify what some of these matches might be. Um, and there's been a lot of effort placed on de novo mutations. These are new mutations that uh, arise in a child with autism that aren't present uh, in the, the parents. And so you can think of these de novo mutations like a match, essentially pushing a genome over the edge. Some of them are highly penetrant. Uh, the de novo mutation itself can give rise to autism. Others have variable penetrance. And so this is sort of the context in which uh, our lab thinks about the environment. Um, so uh, there clearly are some epidemiological studies linking environmental risks to autism, and I'm gonna go over a few of those studies a little bit later. And so you can think of the, these environmental risks not necessarily as causing autism, but perhaps pushing a genome or pushing an individual over to this higher risk category, um, uh, similar to a de novo mutation. And so I just want to focus briefly on these de novo mutations because uh, a revolution has really taken place over the last five or so years uh, in the area of autism genetics. Uh, and much of that has been uh, funded by the Simons Foundation and the NIH. And so the, the gist of these studies uh, is, to, is to take families, uh, sequence unaffected individuals, as well as an affected um, uh, child with autism to try and identify a mutation that's present in the, the, the proband with autism that's not present in the parents. Um, and from these exome sequencing studies, literally hundreds if not thousands of de novo mutations have been identified that um, 
that correlate with autism risk. And so I've listed just a few of these uh, genes uh, up here. So one of the top candidates is CHD8. This is a chromodomain helicase. Um, and data suggests that about 0.43% of all individuals with autism will have a mutation in this gene. So that's one out of every 200 individuals. And so individually, each of these gene mutations is incredibly rare, but collectively they give rise to the spectrum uh, that we see uh, in the area of autism. And obviously, since I'm here, I'm not going to talk much more about these. Um, my real uh, interest is in environment and the question as to whether or not environmental risks might work similar to these de novo mutations and sort of push a, an individual or push a genome over to a higher risk category or one uh, where autism develops. And I would also submit here that um, this represents one of the major biomedical challenges of our time. Uh, we currently have a very difficult time identifying environmental threats to the brain before they actually cause disease. And I also would like to point out that unlike these de novo mutations, which can't be avoided, environmental risks, uh, once you know what they are, have the potential of being, a, 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 you have the potential to avoid them, especially during critical periods of brain development. So if you can identify these risks, there's the potential to at least eliminate an avoidable, what I would consider an avoidable form of autism. We're not going to be able to eliminate de novo mutations, but at least for uh, a subset of uh, autism cases, identifying environmental risk may allow us to uh, reduce the prevalence to some extent. And so the approach that our lab has taken is one uh, that I call a perspective approach. Um, and the, the general idea, it's pretty simple. If we have these de novo mutations that are individually linked to autism risk, can we find chemicals that target some of the same molecular pathways that these de novo gene mutations are located in? And so if a de novo mutation in CHD8 or norexin-1 can push an individual uh, over to develop autism, could a chemical that targets that same molecular pathway do the same thing? And if so, how do we find those chemicals? And so uh, thanks to these studies of de novo mutations, we now have this long list, relatively long list of genes linked to autism risk. And a number of labs have done uh, a number of analyses to try and assess whether or not autism is incredibly heterogeneous, heterogeneous or if, um, if these genes cluster in certain functional pathways. And uh, what has uh, come about from a number of these studies is that you know, this is showing a relatively recent study looking at maybe nine different functional pathways. But many of these uh, analyses tend to center on a, a much smaller number of pathway, pathways linked, or, linked to, to synaptic function, um, as well as to uh, early developmental effects uh, in the Wnt beta catenin pathway. And then there's also the C4 module. A lot of these autism linked genes are linked to transcriptional regulation. Um, and the immune response. And so I'm going to highlight how uh, environmental risks that target these pathways could be, uh, uh, could be identified. And so for, as far as synaptic function is concerned, um, as many of you know, the synapse represents the point of communication between neurons. I'm going to show a blow up of, of a synapse next. So a synapse is made up of a presynaptic neuron that dumps neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft and is received by the postsynaptic neuron. And what I've circled here are a number of genes that build the synapse and that are also uh, linked to uh, autism risk. Several years ago, our lab made the observation that uh, many of these synaptic genes have a unique uh, physical property, and that is they are unusually long. They take up a lot of space in the genome. And so, for example, these autism genes uh, are all well over 100. Uh, many of these genes are well over 100 kilobases. Uh, and I highlight one gene, norexin-3, as an example. This is a gene that is 1,612 kilobases. That's 1.2 megabases. And so I drew this to scale relative to the average gene, which is about 60 kilobases. And so many of these synaptic genes are incredibly long, 20 times longer than the aver average gene. A few years ago, I wrote a, a viewpoint in, um, uh, for Safari about what does it mean to be a long gene? What are the biological implications? So a big gene, for example, is going to be a bigger target for random mutations. Uh, big genes take a long time to transcribe. You know, an RNA polymerase starts at the beginning of a gene and has to go all the way to the end before a transcript is produced. It can take anywhere from 6 to 10 hours to get from one end of a big gene to the other, whereas a short gene, maybe 10 minutes. And so chemicals that perturb this transcription process 
have the potential to disproportionately affect the expression of long genes and proteins relative to shorter uh, genes. And the other thing that is, in, is interesting about long genes, when you sort of think about it or when you, when you look at it, when you look at gene expression through this length perspective, is that the nervous system seems to be unique. Uh, what we're looking at here is uh, expression data from a number of mouse tissues ranging from the amygdala all the way to snout epidermis. And what we did is we highlighted all of the neural tissues in red and the non-neural tissues in gray. And then we looked at the gene expression data from each of these tissues and generated a single number that represents whether or not the expression of all the genes is biased. So are there relatively more long genes in this tissue or relatively more short genes expressed? And if the number is positive, this is what we call a positive length correlation, that means there's an overrepresentation of long genes in that tissue. And what you can clearly see is that there's an overrepresentation of long genes in uh, neural tissues relative to non-neural tissues. Yeah, did you have a question? Uh, they're fine. These de novo mutations in general are in all over the genes. Uh, should we t wait till the, the end for questions? And so then the question, so these are, you know, these are tissues like amygdala frontal cortex, and the brain uh, obviously is made up of many cell types. And so the question is what cells are driving this length correlation? And so with the advent of single cell sequencing, we are able to go back and look at some of, the, uh, th some of this data, and we find it's the neurons that overrepresent, uh, overexpress these very long synaptic genes. Other cells like astrocytes and ependymal cells uh, tend to not ex overexpress uh, long genes. And so then this now raises the question, like if there are chemicals that affect disproportionately long synaptic genes, um, you know, do they exist and might they affect synaptic function? And so a few years ago, we made a, a novel observation regarding a class of chemicals called topoisomerase inhibitors. These are drugs that are used to treat cancer. Um, we made this uh, observation um, because we had been studying topoisomerase inhibitors in the context of a different neurodevelopmental disorder called Angelman syndrome. I don't have time to go over that study. Uh, much of it has been published. But suffice it to say, as we drilled down to try and understand better how topoisomerase inhibitors worked uh, at the gene expression level, we found they had a disproportionate effect on the expression of very long transcripts. And so what you're looking at here is gene expression comparing drug-treated cells to vehicle. And then along the, the, the x-axis is gene length. Each dot represents the average expression change of 200 genes. Um, binned by length, and so this helps clean up the data. And as you can see, uh, shorter genes uh, are maybe increased a little bit in expression. Uh, once you get to about 100 kilobases, you see this dramatic reduction in expression. And when we looked at what those long genes were, as I mentioned, they were all uh, primarily synap long synaptic genes. And so this has implications at the protein level. So norexin-1, NRX-1, is an autism high-confidence autism candidate. This is now the protein level. If you look at the, the leftmost lane, you can see that um, prior to drug treatment, there's plenty of protein in these neuronal cultures. After treating for, with topo tecan for 72 hours, not only does it downregulate long genes, but it also uh, virtually knocks out the protein. Uh, this effect can be washed out. As you can see, 24 through 72 hours of washout, the protein bounces back. Another long gene linked to autism is neuroligand, which is the ligand for norexin-1, interact. That also is downregulated in a reversible manner. And so you can begin to see how a chemical um, has the potential to target many of these long genes, many of which are linked to autism risk. And so we also wanted to know whether or not these, pro these uh, chemicals affect synaptic function. And so we did a number of electrophysiological experiments, all of which are published. I just highlight one experiment here where we looked at network activity in cortical neuron cultures. And so if you put cortical neurons in a dish and let them uh, grow for, uh, for several days, they eventually form synapses and start to fire in bursts. And you can see this burst, these bursts electrophysiologically, and you can also see them using a calcium-sensitive dye. And so that's what we're looking at here. These are neurons loaded with FURA2, calcium-sensitive dye. And then we just image over time, and you can see these bursts. Each of those lines is a different color. That represents a different neuron. You can see each neuron is bursting in synchrony at a low amplitude. When we add this drug, GBZ, that's gabazine, that increases the amplitude of that bursting. But you can see that they still are all bursting in synchrony. And so this is a, a measure of synaptic activity, network activity, and culture.
And we know that it's glutamate mediated because all the way over there at the right, uh, DNQX is a glutamate receptor blocker. So we can eliminate this bursting with DNQX. When we do these same experiments in topo tecan treated cultures, you know, not only are the long genes down, including a lot of these synaptic genes, but it also virtually eliminates this spontaneous network activity in culture. And adding gabazine uh, really has no effect whatsoever. So you see this profound reduction in synaptic activity in the presence of this drug that downregulates uh, long genes. And so are there other chemicals or other genes linked to autism that might uh, work through a similar mechanism? And so when looking at the de novo data, uh, the answer is yes. And so there's another gene, high confidence gene linked to autism called SCN2A. It's a, sodium, it's a voltage gated sodium channel. There are a number of missense mutations in this channel. So missense mutations are mutations that change an amino acid. And many of these mutations are linked or are located very close to the ion selectivity uh, pore. There was a recent paper that came out from Kevin Bender's lab just a few weeks ago, actually maybe a week or two ago, um, trying to understand how these mutations affect channel function. And basically what his lab found is that these autism linked mutations in this channel seem to dampen or eliminate uh, channel function. So this is interesting because there is a class of environmental use chemicals that um, uh, are very common. They're called pyrethroids, which also target uh, voltage gated sodium channels, including this one. They work by, they essentially kill bugs by uh, binding to the sodium channels in the bug brain. But these uh, pyrethroids also interact with mammalian sodium channels. And so these pyrethroids <clears throat> are present on our food. Uh, they're used to, to, to treat, uh, to eliminate pests. They're also found in our houses quite commonly. Uh, so when an exterminator comes in to treat for bugs, pyrethroids are typically used. Uh, and they appear to be uh, present in humans of all ages. There's a study uh, run by NHANES that samples human blood and urine uh, of children of all ages. And they find that virtually all of the uh, people sampled have detectable levels of pyrethroids or metabolites in their, in their, in their body. So humans are definitely exposed to this <coughs> class of chemicals. And so at a neurobiological level, uh, these chemicals um, prolong the open state of these channels. And then when the channels close or inactivate, it also prolongs the closed state. So these channels have the potential to essentially shut, ultimately, in long term, shut down the channels. We know that uh, acutely, uh, these pyrethroids, when added to mammalian neurons, will cause <coughs> uh, immediate early gene induction. And so this is a transcriptional readout that I'm going to come back to. We also know from using similar experiments that we did with calcium imaging that they blunt synaptic activity, much like uh, topo tecan. And so this is work done by Tim Schaefer um, at the EPA, which is uh, actually right down the road from, from UNC. So these are two different pyrethroids showing dose-dependent reductions in spontaneous network activity in culture. So these chemicals seem to have functions that are, they target uh, an autism gene, uh, high confidence autism gene and have functions that are very similar to autism linked mutations in that gene. And perhaps more, most relevant of all, uh, epidemiological studies um, have recently linked pyrethroid exposure during the third trimester to increased autism risk. And so this was a really nice study where it was done in California. California has really good environmental sampling data um, at a regional level, level. And so they went in and they were able to assess <coughs> exposure levels to a variety of pesticides um, uh, of pregnant women and look at the proximity to, of, of exposure to uh, autism risk. And they basically find that uh, the closer an, a woman is to uh, an exposed area, the greater their, their risk for, um, for autism, for having a child with autism. And so then this raises the question, could, could, py could pyrethroids or chemicals that act like pyrethroids that are present in the environment that humans are exposed to represent chemical risks for autism? Could they essentially flip the switch um, similar to a de novo mutation in a channel like SCN2A? Uh, so I also talked about the Wnt uh, beta catenin signaling pathway, as that's another high uh, pathway that seems to be implicated in autism. And so for those of you not familiar with this pathway, at its core is a protein called beta-catenin. This is a, a protein that is held in a complex called the destruction complex. Uh, and while in that complex, it is phosphorylated by a protein called GSK3-beta. And when phosphorylated, it is targeted for degradation by the proteasome. So this destruction complex essentially eliminates uh, beta-catenin. 
in the presence of Wnt ligand. Uh, Wnt is a protein, it's a secreted protein. Uh, that leads to the, uh, the dissolution of this destruction complex and beta-catenin is then free to enter the nucleus and interact with transcriptional regulators, um, such as CHD8, um, to, to regulate uh, Wnt target genes. And so this Wnt pathway has been heavily studied in the context of cancer. There are a number of mutations in this uh, pathway that lead to overproliferation of, of cells and, and cancer. Uh, but we're now realizing, thanks to you know, work from uh, the Simon's uh, simplex collection uh, sequencing and others, that a disproportionate number of autism genes are in this wind signaling pathway. So Alan Packer wrote a recent uh, editorial about this. At least 16% of all the ASD genes are, uh, implicate, are in this pathway in some way or another. Um, and so that includes this gene, which I keep talking about, CHD8. This is one of the highest confidence autism genes. Macrocephaly, or an enlarged head, is one of the common phenotypes. Over here on the right is the, uh, the growth curve of head circumference, uh, tracking two individuals. And so they're you know, on the upper end of the growth circumference curve for, for children. And so this overgrowth, this cortical overgrowth, is interesting for another reason, uh, because many labs, uh, not many labs, but Joe Piven's lab, so, so Eric Corshane's lab, have, have noted that uh, cortical overgrowth is a relatively common uh, phenotype in many individuals with autism. And so just to pull, make a plug for, for Joe's work, uh, just last week he had a paper published in, in Nature um, and using uh, brain imaging data, he was able to, to show that you can predict whether or not a child was gonna go on to develop autism based on a brain scan between the ages of six months and 12 months of age. And so there are changes in the brain, brain enlargement, that precede the um, diagnosis, uh, behavioral diagnosis of autism. So this really highlights the, you know, further the idea that autism pathogenesis really initiates very early, probably prenatally, um, and overgrowth um, is, is one of the uh, common phenotypes possibly related to this pathway. So if this pathway is implicated, are there chemicals that target this pathway that are also linked to autism? And so the answer is yes. And so there's a drug called valproate or valproic acid. This is an anti-epileptic. This is a drug that's used to treat uh, epilepsy in, in, in humans. It works quite well. Um, it's also known that valproate, um, when given to women during pregnancy, um, can increase the risk for birth defects. Um, but despite that risk, uh, women who have epilepsy um, often still take this drug because the, the risk of having a child with a birth defect is relatively minor compared to the, the risk of having a seizure and dying during pregnancy. So if, if valproate is good at treating her seizures, they, you know, they'll often remain on this drug. And so uh, for children who, so, so valproate is also uh, really the, the model that everyone in the field uses uh, as an environmental risk for autism. Um, so valproate exposure in rats as well as in mice uh, produce, uh, during the prenatal period uh, leads to autism symptoms in, in, the, uh, in the mice or the rats. And a very recent study uh, has shown that uh, exposure throughout the course of development uh, in mice leads to cortical overgrowth. So this is another example of a, a chemical targeting the wind pathway affecting brain development and linked to autism risk in rodents. But I think the, the, the key paper is this one published back in 2013 where they looked at mothers, uh, uh, children um, from mothers who took uh, valproate during pregnancy and found a, a significantly increased risk for autism in their offspring. And so I think this provides another uh, good hint that chemicals that target uh, the Wnt pathway or chemicals that act like valproic acid could represent environmental risks for autism. So the last uh, pathway I just want to talk about is neuroimmune activation. And so it's also no, well known epidemiologically that prenatal um, when mother infection during the second trimester is also implicated in autism risk. So we, we call this the maternal immune activation model. Uh, you can mimic this in rodents by injecting poly-IC, which uh, mimics this, uh, this viral um, neuroimmune activation. And so also in postmortem studies of um, of young of children and young adults, uh, as well as older adults, looking at uh, transcriptomic changes in the brains of individuals with autism, neuroimmune activation seems to be a prominent feature in many, but not all, individuals. Now, this is a, a really a landmark paper from Dan Geschwin's lab, 
where he transcriptionally profiled uh, the brains of individuals with autism versus controls. And he found two classes of genes that, are, that seem to be misregulated. And so in many of the individuals, uh, these red bars going down um, showed reduction in, in the expression of many of these synaptic genes, these long synaptic genes, uh, and an elevated expression of neuroimmune type genes. Um, and no, a number of other studies, Dan Arking's lab has reproduced this. Uh, there's clear evidence of neuroimmune activation in uh, older individuals with autism. And so might chemicals that target uh, the neuroimmune system or lead to um, immune activation represent environmental risks. And so the, the general idea, I've, I've highlighted a couple of pathways now strongly implicated in autism. And so the question is, can we identify environmental use chemicals that target uh, any of these pathways? Synaptic function, we've given an example of topoisomerase inhibitors. Might there be other chemicals like topoisomerase inhibitors in the environment? Sodium channels, pyrethroids is one example, but there might be others. Uh, Wnt beta catenin pathway, and then neuroinflammation. So the approach our lab has taken to identify these uh, chemicals or these candidate risks is a transcriptomics-based approach. And so the idea is pretty simple. Uh, what we do is we take chemicals um, from, um, initially we, uh, we're starting with the EPA's ToxCast library. This is a library of about 300 environmental use chemicals. So this includes pesticides and herbicides, uh, plasticizers, et cetera. We add them one by one to uh, cultured cortical neurons. Uh, we also used topotecan and other topoisomerase inhibitors as positive controls and vehicle-treated negative controls. Uh, and then the question was, could we find chemicals that mimic some of these uh, pathways that are, that are affected by autism? Before doing this, uh, we pre-screen the library for toxicity because there's obviously no point in sequencing dead neurons. Um, and so we, we uh, did this in 96 well dishes. We found a non-toxic dose, and that was the dose that we ultimately sequenced. And so this is relatively low throughput. The neurons were dosed in 12 well plates. RNA was collected, multiplexed 24 samples per lane, and then sequenced. Before I show you the data, I just want to highlight uh, the utility of, of these cultures, these mouse embryonic cortical neuron cultures. Um, they seem to, because ultimately our goal was to compare the transcriptional profiles in these cultures to human brain data, um, and so we wanted to make sure that these cultures transcriptionally modeled uh, the human brain. And so uh, using single cell data, we were able to confirm that these cultures have more or less all of the cells in the, in the brain, um, neurons, glia, et cetera. We used immunostaining to also show that these cultures contain all of the cell types. And then we also used uh, transcriptomics. And so what we did is we took RNA-seq data from these cultures and then compared that to RNA-seq data from many different human uh, tissues, brain tissues in red, and then non-brain uh, tissues in black. And uh, as you can clearly see, the mouse uh, data correlates best with human brain tissue, uh, as opposed to all other brain tissues, uh, all other uh, human tissues that are non-brain. Non so this contrast with a different uh, cell, um, which are human embryonic stem cell-derived neurons, and so many people are using human uh, ES-derived neurons or IPS-derived neurons to, to, to study um, uh, autism risk. Uh, but at least in this case, these human ES-derived neurons do not model the complexity of the human brain as well. And so what we did here is we took RNA-seq data from IPS-derived neurons uh, and looked at the same GTEx data. And we find that there's very little correlation between ES-derived neurons and uh, human brain regions. And we think this has to do with the fact that you know, when you generate an ES-derived neuron, you generate a neuron. You don't generate the microglia and the astrocytes and all the different cell types that make up the brain. Um, and so we think it's actually important to have these different cell types because the transcriptional changes that take place in the brain of autism aren't just neurons. Uh, it may be neurons and then the, the glial response to what happens in neurons. And so we did this experiment. Uh, this is now uh, the summary of like two and a half years of work and, and a lot of money on RNA-seq. Uh, along the top axis, along the x-axis effectively, uh, are the 300 plus chemicals. And then along the y-axis are uh, the 5,000 variably expressed genes. And so these are the genes that uh, increased or decreased in some proportion of the samples. We basically threw out all the genes that were just not expressed because they really had no, con conveyed no information. And we then performed um, batch correction and normalization of the data so we could combine all of these uh, experiments that took place over the course of two and a half years. Uh, 
and we were very happy to see after clustering the data. So we were clustering to try and find chemicals that had similar transcriptional effects in these neurons. We were happy to see that the topoisomerase inhibitors that we used all clustered together. So we used three different topoisomerase inhibitors, and the main uh, uh, two effects that they had, one was downregulation of many long genes. And so we show the, the long genes are here, and we show that they're long by putting a tick mark next to any gene that is 100 kilobases or longer. So you can see a lot of the long genes are uh, represented in this little patch. The other thing we noticed was that uh, these topoisomerase inhibitors downregulated these genes. And if you look over here, those are all immediate early genes, like FOS, uh, BDNF, et cetera. And so this is consistent with these, these chemicals downregulating long synaptic genes and dampening synaptic activity, which will have an effect on dampening immediate early genes, which are normally turned on when cultures are bursting. So I just want to briefly highlight cluster one. I'm not going to talk more about it after, uh, after this slide. But this, this cluster has a number of chemicals that include pyrethroids. And so you can clearly see that these chemicals are inducing immediate early genes. And remember I said that acute application of these chemicals causes uh, calcium influx and immediate early gene induction. And they also downregulate uh, potassium channels. And so this is a unique transcriptional signature of this pyrethroid class of chemicals. The chemicals I want to talk about for the, you know, the remainder of this uh, presentation are the cluster two chemicals. So these are chemicals that upregulated red, uh, many neuroimmune genes, uh, as well as cytoskeletal genes and then downregulated a number of uh, ion channels and uh, some of the, the long uh, synaptic genes. And so we tried to then assess whether or not these cluster two chemicals transcriptionally mimicked um, the, the changes that are seen in the brains of individuals with autism. And so to do that, we used uh, a technique called gene set enrichment analysis. Uh, this is where you take the list of genes that are upregulated in autism brain or downregulated in autism brain and use statistical, uh, a statistical test to see if your chemical class upregulates or downregulates those same genes. And so we did this for each of the clusters um, going across the top. And as you can see, the only chemical class that uh, regulates autism genes, um, uh, these, these tr uh, the only chemical class that causes this transcriptional signature of autism is cluster two. And so if you look at the downregulated Gupta mod one, so these are the synaptic genes that are down. These chemicals downregulate those genes. And then the upregulated Gupta mod five, those are some of those neuroimmune genes. So they were significantly upregulated. We also looked at, um, in the Vonnegut data set, uh, we saw the same thing. And so basically, these chemicals are downregulating synaptic genes and upregulating neuroimmune genes, very similar to what is seen in the autism brain. Um, what was interesting is that this cluster two uh, class of chemicals also look like other um, uh, brain, uh, other human brain tissue, including aging brain and some forms of neurodegeneration. And so what we think this chemical class is picking up on is an underlying signature of neurodegeneration um, in uh, the brains of uh, at least some individuals with uh, autism. Um, my colleague Joe Piven has actually been trying to track down older individuals with autism. Uh, just to find out you know, what, what, are, what are some of the uh, symptoms of older, older individuals with autism. And he's, fi he's finding a significant number, like one out of every four, have some sort of movement disorder or Parkinsonian-like uh, condition. Um, and relative to the general population, Parkinson's affects maybe one out of every 5,000. Um, so there, there's the, there may be some underlying neurodegeneration that's taking place as individuals with uh, autism age. And this uh, transcriptomics uh, signature might be picking that up. And so what are these chemicals uh, in cluster two? So two of the chemicals are uh, shown here, um, phenamidone and praclostrobin. Now these are chemicals you probably have never heard of. I know I never heard of them at, uh, when I started this project. Uh, you can see that they don't look like one another. They're, they Structurally, they're very different. Um, but both of them uh, are known to be uh, fungicides um, that target, uh, you know, basically fungi that grow on plants. And so these are used to, to treat molds and, and rusts and things like that on food crops. And so we then did uh, RNA-seq, um, more RNA-seq, just to assess at a, very, uh, at a really uh, statistically significant level whether or not they up and down regulate the same genes. Uh, and so that's what these Venn diagrams are showing, is that uh, even though they look structurally different, they are turning up and down more or less the same genes. And so some of the genes that they're affecting are shown here. 
This includes uh, GST genes. These are glutathione as transferase genes. These are genes that are induced in response to, typically indu induced in response to oxidative stress. And so uh, this is qPCR validation that these genes are getting turned on. And then over in panel F, we were able to show that there's a dose-dependent increase in the expression of several of these genes. And so these chemicals, the way these chemicals work is by poisoning uh, mitochondrial complex three. So the mitochondria are the energy sources, uh, generate energy for your cells. Um, and if complex one or complex three are poisoned, uh, superoxide, that's what the O2 is, builds up and this can cause damage to, to neurons. And so this superoxide is also known as ROS or reactive oxygen. And so we wanted to see if these chemicals were indeed inducing ROS in these neurons. And so we used a dye called mitosox, which turns red in the presence of uh, reactive oxygen. So these are cortical neuron cultures, vehicle treated and phenamidone treated. And you can clearly see they turn red. They also sort of round up um, and ultimately, they, they would die if you let this uh, chemical on long term. This, these are pretty nasty chemicals. Um, and so we quantified both the ROS production and this change in cell morphology. And we found that both of them, the ROS and the morph morphological changes, were um, dose dependent. And then what I circled there in red are the doses that we used for sequencing. And so this, transcript this transcriptional uh, signature of autism is induced um, at drug concentrations that induce these reactive oxygen species uh, and, uh, changes as well as morphological changes. And so uh, with ROS, you know, one way that people often try and block this is with vitamin E, which is an antioxidant. And this is just showing that the, the drug causes ROS and that if you pretreat with vitamin E, you can block the ROS. You can also block the aberrant cell morphology uh, with vitamin E. And what was interesting is since the cells change shape, we were wondering if the, there were, may, might be effects on the cytoskeleton. So we looked at actin, we looked at microtubules. And so it turns out that these chemicals are not only producing ROS, but also destabilizing microtubules. And so if you use a drug, Taxol, which stabilizes microtubules, that can reduce the formation of ROS and also reduce the aberrant cell morphology. And so these two processes, ROS and microtubule destabilization, seem to go hand in hand. And so this is great. This is RNA-seq. Uh, we did like 300 chemicals, but we ultimately really want to accelerate the pace uh, at which we find these chemicals and also look beyond just cluster two. Uh, ultimately, there are 80,000 plus chemicals approved for use in the environment. Uh, many of these, in fact, most of them have not been tested uh, on on the developing brain or even adults. Um, and so we have very little understanding of how these chemicals ha uh, affect uh, the developing or adult brain. The approach that we used, RNA-seq, is uh, labor intensive and costly. It costs us about $200 per chemical uh, dose. And so we really wanted to find a, a cheaper way of doing this. The nice thing about the RNA-seq data is that it at least told us what, chem what genes best represent each of those clusters. So we really don't need RNA-seq to find more chemicals in any of these clusters. Instead, we can use gene markers. And the approach that we took to do this was um, a, high a, new high a relatively new high-throughput sequencing approach called RASL-seq. RASL-seq stands for RNA annealing, selection, and ligation. And so you can think of this as a quantitative PCR on steroids. Uh, it's a much uh, more simplified procedure. You take neurons, you can put them in 384 well dishes, uh, you lyse the cells, and then you can directly interrogate uh, gene expression without using reverse transcriptase and cDNA construction. So you basically lyse the cells, you then add a magnetic oligo DT labeled bead, and you fish out the polyadenylated transcripts, and then you add probes to whatever genes you're interested in interrogating, such as those GST genes. These probes will bind to the RNA template and hybridize. And if they hybridize, um, you then add a ligase, an RNA ligase, that will join those two pieces together and create a 40 nucleotide sequence. You then use PCR with unique barcodes um, that are specific to each plate and each well, amplify, and then sequence. And then you can basically combine all 384 wells or thousands of wells together uh, in, uh, in, in, in a single high seq. Uh, and do quantitative transcriptomics on hundreds of genes. And so the advantage of this is that it's incredibly high throughput. Uh, we've got this up and running in the lab. It's automated. 
Uh, we can process a single 384 well plate of neurons in uh, under three hours. Um, the barcode combination allows for 36,000 uh, different combinations, so you can test 36,000 different chemicals if you have the money to culture 36,000 different wells of neurons. Um, and this uh, can be done for under $2 per, per replicate. So this is just showing uh, what the data look like. So this is uh, a reduced probe set now. This is a probe set that will interrogate uh, different uh, you know, clusters. And so up, up top you can see cluster one, uh, cyfluthrin is a pyrethroid at increasing doses. You can see that at increasing doses it turns on some genes there and they happen to be immediate early genes. But they don't consistently turn on anything else. And so we'll be able to identify pyrethroids based on their unique ability to induce immediate early genes in these cultures. Cluster two is phenamidone. As you increase the dose, you can see that that turns on uh, a, a cluster of genes. And those are the genes that mark the neuroinflammatory uh, cluster. And they also downregulate um, some genes, some of the synaptic genes. And that's a unique uh, transcriptional profile. And then the last is cluster five, these uh, topoisomerase inhibitors, which downregulate long genes. The long synaptic gene cluster is down there at the bottom. Uh, and in previous work, we found that topoisomerase inhibitors also upregulate UB3A. So UB3A is on there, and you can see a dose-dependent increase in UB3A. And so we can use these unique transcriptional signatures um, in this automated manner to now scan through uh, thousands of chemicals and use transcriptomics to prospectively identify candidate environmental risks for autism. And so we've essentially taken a technology that's typically used for drug discovery, and we're trying to now use it to find chemical risks for, for autism. So what are the next steps? Um, and so obviously, you know, when you're screening thousands of chemicals, we, we're going to find a number of things that fall within each of these clusters. Um, but many of those are not going to represent risks, especially if humans are never exposed to them. And so one of the other things that we're very interested in doing and working on is trying to assess exposure threat to humans based on existing environmental sampling data and then trying to generate our own environmental sa sampling data. And then uh, the other thing is to then validate risk potential in vivo uh, in animal models. So do the chemicals cause, quote unquote, autism in an animal model, like valproic acid does, um, or do they only do that in a genetically sensitized background, so for example, in an autism mutant uh, mouse model? And so uh, exp uh, assessing exposure threats. So this just gives you an idea is that you know, these chemicals are applied to our food. The EPA and the USDA tracks uh, pesticide residues uh, on our food uh, to make sure they're within allowable limits. These data are publicly available. And so we've gone through and analyzed uh, all of that data um, for a number of uh, cluster two fungicides. I'm just gonna show you one here. This is paraclostrobin. And so this is a chemical class uh, that really was only recently um, uh, approved for use in the environment. So paraclostrobin was first approved in, in 2002. That's what that little red arrow indicates. And then what this is showing is uh, how many millions of kilograms were used in the United States. And you can see there's an upward traje trajectory. And in fact, for all of these fungicides in cluster two, um, their, their use is skyrocketing because they're very effective at treating fungus. Uh, and over here is a graph that just highlights uh, some of the foods that contain uh, these residues. This is looking at the maximal, the, the foods with the highest levels of ever detected of these chemicals. Um, and so I think it's important to point out that you know, this, is, this is just like the potential maximum. Um, on average, these foods may have much lower levels or, or no levels. Um, so just, just keep that in mind. Don't get like, too freaked out. You can still eat your spinach. And so to summarize this part, what we've been able to do using transcriptomics um, it, for cluster two anyhow, is to identify a class of chemicals that transcriptionally mimic um, the, the, the changes that are seen in the, in the postmortem autism brain. We know from data that the EPA collected using something called reverse dosimetry, where they take those environmental sampling data and then extrapolate that to cell-based models. Uh, and then try and figure out whether or not the dose on the food has the potential to affect human biology. And so they found that for you know, many of the chemicals, if there are only a small number of chemicals, uh, there is this potential, and praclostrobin was one of them with the potential to affect human biology. Um, these are foods, uh, these are, uh, can be found in baby foods, so if there's anything with spinach that's not organic, it'll have, it has the potential to have these chemicals. 
the good news is that you can avoid them, uh, these foods, by eating organically. So this is sort of where we stood when we wrote this paper. Uh, I, was always, I was obviously very interested in like, figuring out where else these chemicals might be found in the environment. So in doing more research, I ran across uh, this patent um, that was submitted in 2006 from Syngenta. Um, and if you read the yellow highlight, it says this invention relates to the treatment of wallboards with a fungicidally effective amount of strobilurin or strobilurin type fungicides uh, and with a focus in the next sentence on azoxystrobin, which are, is one of these chemicals that can induce this transcriptional signature. And so uh, I then did a little bit more searching and found out that these wallboards are available now. You can buy them. Uh, they first started uh, being marketed in 2009. I went to my local Lowe's and sure enough, I took a picture. Uh, these are purple wallboards um, and they're being used in, in homes uh, uh, these days. Uh, you can't read the sign, it says purple, but in small text it says purple is the new green board. And so for those of you who know about uh, building, like whenever there's an area there's, that's sensitive to mold, like showers and kitchens, uh, green boards are typically used uh, to limit mold growth but they're now marketing these for use in, in lieu of green boards. And in fact, I couldn't find green boards when I took this picture. But I think what may be more troubling is that they're also marketing these for use throughout the house because you know, people are afraid of like, toxic molds and things like that. Um, and so these are boards that are now being put literally everywhere. Um, and this is the, the point where I wanna also now highlight that in cluster two was another chemical called rotenone. Rotenone also poisons mitochondria complex one um, that's a chemical that's epidemiologically linked to Parkinson's disease risk. And so rotenone has been you know, largely phased out of use because of this linkage. And so we are now building houses with a chemical that basically targets the same um, molecular pathway. Uh, and essentially our whole houses are gonna be potentially filled with like low levels of these uh, fungicides. So a future direction working with other colleagues is to start environmental sampling in homes um, and correlating levels of some of these fungicides with construction, new construction versus old construction, renovations, et cetera. And that's really just the first step to beginning epidemiological studies linking exposure to autism risk or uh, neurodegeneration risk. And so the last step uh, is to ultimately validate risk potential in vivo. And so we don't have uh, final data on this. I just wanna highlight the direction that we're, we're trying to go with cluster two chemicals as well as other uh, uh, cluster chemicals. And so do the chemicals cause or exacerbate autism symptoms in, in wild type or autism model mice? And so for the strobilurin fungicides, we know that in vitro they induce ROS, they, de they destabilize microtubules, uh, which can affect neuronal migration, uh, and they cause this transcriptional signature of autism with neuromine genes up and synaptic genes down. And so to, so as not to reinvent the wheel, we went and looked at a lot of the toxicological assays that, that were already done to, to try and figure out just what to dissolve these chemicals in. Um, and this is where we got our first sort of surprise, I guess. Basically, basically all the tests that were used to uh, evaluate whether or not these are toxic in mammals used uh, aqueous uh, uh, solvents, uh, specifically methyl cellulose or CMC, which is carboxymethyl cellulose. Um, and as you can see, A and B, uh, this stuff doesn't dissolve in these, uh, these, sol these aqueous solvents, but it does do dissolve very effectively in corn oil. So I don't show, I'm not gonna show you the data, but we basically did some in vivo studies uh, in these different solvents, and we only really see uh, effects um, in the corn oil, as you might expect, um, because the, the chemical doesn't even get in um, with uh, methyl cellulose. And so some of the effects we see um, so we, we actually have gone down and lowered the dose because we're trying to find low doses and higher doses that are not lethal um, to the animals for, 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 basic, for these autism type studies. And so we found that so the, the three samples are black as corn oil, which is just the vehicle, gray as corn oil and 10 mg per kg per aquastrobin, and then red as a higher dose. And so you can see that as you increase the dose, one of the main uh, symptoms is um, basically massive diarrhea um, uh, you also see a big change in body temperature that lasts for at least uh, a day, a uh, reduction in body weight that lasts at least for two days at the higher dose, and then uh, a reduction in motor activity. So we look at wheel running in the animals, uh, and this causes you know, the animals to just not want to run for, for, for some reason. And so now that we've identified doses, we can now go in and, and do uh, studies like this where we can look at acute exposure or chronic exposure uh, during the window of uh, 
of brain development, E11.5 e through P0, where the brain, where the cortex uh, is developing, and then assess at different time points, like at birth, three months, as well as six months, uh, brain weight, as well as histological and uh, transcriptomic uh, phenotypes. So do these chemicals alter the size of the brain? Uh, do they induce this neuroinflammatory signature? And do they cause behavioral phenotypes of autism? Um, and so I will end there and just acknowledge that this has a, been a collaborative work, uh, collaborative project with many people in my lab. Um, I see that I'm running out of time and I wanna make sure I have uh, a chance to answer questions. So I'll leave it there um, and take your questions. <laughs>